Hello everybody, welcome, welcome back to another episode of Let's Play Hearts of Iron 4 New Orders America. Let us continue on from where we last left off. So, Iceland is currently uh, very upset. What is what is this? What is their ideology? Free market. They're very, very free market. Okay. Anyways, Iceland is not happy with us. The population there is furious that Americans can basically do whatever the hell they want. So they're protesting that. We'll probably see the OFN uh, referendum either... This episode, maybe next. Uh, aside from that, we have won the war in Egypt, we have won the war in Iraq, we have war won the war in Yemen, and now it's just Oman and Sudan we have left. And I'm assuming, I think we should get 5 out of 5. I don't see a reason why we wouldn't. Also, I will say the game's actually running pretty well today. I don't know what the hell is different, but it, it seems like it's going pretty well. Flying off the shelves! The Middle East was burning. New, unique nation states were rising, as the old established order was falling. Something that Congresswoman Jeanette Kirkpatrick had long been expected. She predicted something quite similar in her 1968 book, uh, Dictatorships and Double Standards. Of course, she hadn't gotten the exact details correct. She had predicted the hegemon ideology would be right-wing, along national socialist lines, in a uh, in nature, rather than left-wing. But besides that, she had uh, been bang on with most things. She had predicted the rise of totalitarianism, or perhaps authoritarianism, depending on how the uh, depending on the rest of the world government, uh, and she had been proving right. She predicted that the global oil markets would implode, and she had been pro and she was proven right there. Most of all, she predicted intervention from the Reich, Japan, and the United States, something that has certainly happened. Readers were taking notice of both the book and its author. Every major bookstore at the library, Congresswoman Kirkpatrick's book was in high demand. It offered a unique proposal on what would uh, on what to do in the Middle East, as well as to extend the, to the uh, rest of the world. It was real politic taken to its maximum extension. Every day, Congresswoman Kirkpatrick received calls and letters from the people asking her to clarify bits and pieces of the Kirkpatrick doctrine. Questions she would happily answer. Congresswoman Kirkpatrick was doing what she uh, always had uh, wanted to do. She was helping to change the minds and hearts. People who were previously opposed to interventionism now found themselves singing Kirkpatrick's tune. And those who had already been in favor, even more so. Every foreign policy institute, every international relations class would sing her praises. At least the ones that matters. Georgetown American University, Tufts, Stanford, Yale, all reached out for her for speeches and interviews. Request, she happily obliged. Jean Kirkpatrick was a household name, at least in some households. Okay, let's get, uh... Jean Kirkpatrick would be going off on election Twitter right now, for sure, for sure. Okay, we've taken this area. Volunteer Force is now right back home. We can send you into Purple Army. Are you really not dead? No. I think we just need to start... I think we just need to take random provinces. I think that's just kind of, uh... Where we're at at the moment. We can counter push into you. It looks like Germany nor Japan really had any interest in Sudan. So, I mean, that works out for me. Even then, I don't actually... Does Sudan even have oil? I don't know what, I don't know what they actually even have, really, in uh, Sudan. Oh, no. There's, our, there's German forces here. I guess Japan is here. I just don't know. Uh, they're not making a big of uh, a stink as they usually do. Let's just put it that way. So we're going to take out Bree. So actually, do we need to increase our... Okay, I want to... One second. Because we go into here. We click Foreign Policy. And it says... The more resources we uh, send to help our supported uh, faction, the more we'll gain in the conflict's end. So should I be putting... Even more... Should I be, like, just filling this all out? Increase more commitments. Send them money. Send them advisors. 77. Seems fine. I don't know if this is going to like back, uh, backfire on us at some point. I mean, it's possible. Stabilize Iberia a little bit more. Uh, and that should be fine. How is Iberia looking? Still very, very stable. But of course, they also have the oil crisis. But that is to be expected. I think everybody has the oil crisis right now. Like, do you have it? Does it affect... I guess it, it might just be... Yeah, just like a global... Um, a global... Uh, event there move you guys up north so that might just be like the most annoying just because there's just so many um there's just so many uh n like there's not enough victory points there we go I, I figured out what i was trying to say in the end can i send you i can send you one more troop i'm going to actually i think we actually might just send more to oman right yeah we can send five so actually well okay let's let's get this cleaned up uh, let's send two motorized because I think 
No, one motorized. I'll go to Sudan because Sudan is, I think, pretty flat. And then let's send infantry and a mechanized. We'll send these guys to Oman. Yes, yeah, so you guys go here. And then we'll send you there. Will they be necessary? I'm not 100% too sure, but I think sending them now still will benefit us. If, yeah, you have only three divisions. Send you all the way down to Nazwa. Because, yeah, you are owned by the Bathist. But then we'll kind of keep the pressure on you like so. We'll be happy with this. I don't know when our mechanized division will get there, but hopefully soon. So then, you guys do have attack plans, right? I, I did give you just generic, like, just kind of push in. Figure that out. The Icelandic Domino Teeters. The Atlantic government collapser, President Robert F. Kennedy took a moment to digest the news in the daily briefing, followed by a long, labored sigh. For a country of its size, Iceland has been on everybody's mind for weeks, as the images of burning cars and debris in the streets captured the imagination of OFN capitals from Washington to Canberra. Nobody had expected the Icelandic government to stay in power much longer. All that mattered now was uh, managing the fallout. A caretaker government, even if led by the previous prime minister, would have no authority to meaningfully govern in Iceland, and its critical military contribution in the North Sea. It might even lead to protests threatening the safety of Kelfa Air Base. Even America calls for calm, it might not work. It might even backfire, throwing more fuel onto the fire. America was caught in a contradictory bind. The most powerful state of the OFN, unable to exercise its power in Iceland for fear of worsening the situation. It was a prospect that sat unwell with almost everybody in Washington. Even as Robert F. Kennedy uh, set to work with minimal official tools he had. Maybe Canada or Australia will sway them. I mean, because having Iceland... In the OFN is really, really important to protect power in the North Sea, right? That this, this Iceland is very important. We want to make sure they stay on our side. Because, I mean, Germany, they have Norway. They can project power off of the Norwegian coast, which is why we need Iceland. Like, if we had Norway, maybe they'd be a little bit less important, but still, like, having this is nice. I mean, again, I guess Russia can't send, you know, you can't really show here, but, you know, they send ships up north. They come down south here. You know, the Soviet Union doesn't exist. So, I mean, maybe, maybe Iceland's not as important, but, again, having Norway be pro-Germany is an annoyance for sure. By the way, are you any of you guys ever going to resolve your civil wars? I'm not, I'm not too sure. My, my gut says no. Okay, you are still uh, moving around, taking uh, important areas here, which is nice. Extra division will send to you. Bring you all in. I think I want... You here. I think we take this city that should capitulate the inmate. The Mate. The Emir. Okay, we defeated one of the Sudanese factions, which is great. Okay, let's get the synthetic alternative. So now we are just fighting the Free Authors Organization. You guys can move down here, take these provinces. Actually, delete everything you have. Merge all of you here. You're going to be moving kind of in this direction. Push in. And then this... Um... Are you the super heavy tank? No, you're just the main battle tank. Okay. You go take those provinces. You, my good friends, move in like so. You know what? Actually, be very aggressive as well. I don't see a reason uh, for you not to be. I'm not worried about Sudan in any way, shape, or form, to be honest with you. We should uh, have this very much under our uh, control. Okay, we have German troops. I don't even know why Japan's here. Oh, you know what happened? They probably sent volunteers, and then they spawn in the capital, which is in Hamaya. So, like, it, it looks a little bit strange. Okay, there is a Sudanese victory. I don't know how you're still alive, to be completely honest. Pitch lay at 5%. Okay, because you're annoying. That, that's that's why. You're, you're pain in the ass. That's why you're still here. That's fine. I can, deal with being, I can deal with pain in the asses. You're still looking good. I then immediately want you to counter push your way like so. So we can get our way towards uh, Salah. So we can take the capital of the, of the Baathist regime. What are you guys doing? You're going to go... Okay, you're going to go here, then push your way up north. 
Again, lucky for us, again, Italy said being able to send volunteers does benefit us. Unfortunately, we don't care about South Sudan. Even though I also would like to send some troops down there. There's our volunteer forces. Let's send you. Let's send two to Europe. We're going to send you here and then put the rest in the pink. I think pink is on the Canadian border, if I remember correctly. I think that's where we placed them. Bring you guys down south. There goes the, uh, the Emir. Hold your position. Rekindling. When Christmas came, Eisen retreated into the, uh, its homes at Hearst to celebrate the coming new year. Another year of trouble and tribulation had come to an end, and they were taking a moment to rest ahead of the year to come. The Americans, after all, had the uh, thankless task of standing uh, watch against the Germans. And if that was their law in life, it was surely well deserved when they uh, were occupying foreign soil. They passed, and when 1971 dawned, the students left their homes and returned to the streets, passing by the classrooms without a glance. They were more important battle, uh, more important things to do than study history or mathematics. There was a battle be for the soul of Iceland, and it was theirs to fight. But while the diplomats of the American Embassy braced themselves for yet another year of protests and riots, they studiously uh, reviewed the newspaper and, go and uh, gossip sheets, searching for any advantage in the fight that uh, might matter most, the upcoming elections in the other thing. The students knew this too, and soon the streets were uh, plastered with posters and slogans praising and slandering the UFN, and then Iceland in turn. With the development in Iceland and souring our reputation, we need to take action to defend the opinion of the OFN abroad. So is that now a foreign conflict? Not quite, but we're, we're getting there. When is the election? June, okay. I'm going to say we probably have like three months. That's typically, I think, how... Uh, I, I say things like this, right? Oh, that's typical. I'm just, I'm just say, saying bullshit. I don't actually know. <laughs> but it sounds right. If I say that, it, it sounds more authoritative. Even though I'm just talking bullshit. Okay, there's another German troop killed off. We can now upgrade our... Where is it? APCs. And what do we want to research? And it's 71. Keep getting more armored vehicles. Okay, so we're holding the line. Push you guys forward. Let's see if we are able to get an encirclement of the capital. Because we can do that, then taking the capital should not be uh, too much trouble. I mean, Rex is going to take it anyway, even without the encirclement, which I'm happy to see. I don't know if we're going to need to take the other provinces. Luckily, you know, Oman, uh, yeah, Oman is not a huge country, so taking the extra provinces wouldn't even be a big deal anyways. Okay, German division will get killed. You will be there in one hour. And with that... Ladies and gentlemen, that's victory. I mean, this actually is gone. That's victory in every single country. Oman, Yemen, Iraq, Egypt, Sudan, all of them are now in the wonderful, wonderful OFN. This is splendid news. Say it with me. We love status quo. We love status quo. <laughs> Southern victory in Oman. Hey, excellent. And the Icelandic campaign season begins. Even as the protesters and propaganda had blanketed Reykjavik for months, the official start of the outling election of 1971 was met with a grim, gnawing resolve in the State Department. Ever since Iceland had erupted into OFN protests, policymakers in both Washington and Germania knew that the turning point was coming to the uh, North Atlantic, with Iceland's future in the OFN consuming all the political auction on the island. The election campaign had become an effective referendum on the OFN, a vote that America could not afford to lose. Even if Iceland was not going to break away from the OFN entirely, Iceland was, had uh, no love for the Nazis. A chink in the OFN's armor was a victory for Germania anyways, on the doors of, a Germ of a Germany's European fortress. If the uh, politics was a game of nuanced ambiguities, geopolitics was a zero-sum competition, and Iceland was now the center stage in the Cold War. There would be speeches, there would be meetings, there might even be a couple charitable campaign contributions. It would all be worth it in the end, or so Americans told themselves. Okay, so our volunteers now are heading home. And the 1971 elections. I wish it was going to happen next episode so I'd have better thumbnails, but it is what it is. I've actually, I need to actually make thumbnails for some of the previous episodes because I've, I've, I've had no internet for a few days. Um, I've had no, no internet for a few days, so I haven't actually been able to upload and make the thumbnails properly, which is annoying. So what do we want to do? What do we want to do? Orphan campaign is currently... Leading. Think about Germany. If independent wins, that's also pro-Germany. 
1971 Islamic general elections are driven by the nation's relation with the OFN in the wake of the murder of the student activist and a subsequent cover-up. While anti-OFN sentiments have been brewing on the island since its uh, entry into the alliance, the OFN abuses on the island have caused many to bring into question Iceland's position on the global stage. Iceland's major parties have made their stances on the OFN primary issue on the election, leaving the fate of Iceland in the hands of the coalition that will be governing the Althing. Every media cycle, we will air our message to the people of Iceland. Our rhetoric will consist of three values. Reputation will influence our ability to court independence. This will especially be useful towards the... Uh... Oh, no, independence are not like an... In... Okay, independent is just a... they're not on either side. I thought it was like the independent third party. Um, okay. Let's be switched to uh, campaign. Da, ba, ba, ba. We will rely on independence to help form a governing body. Tone of the campaign will influence both the effectiveness of our message. If we remain positive, we may influence voters off of good, uh, uh, we may influence voters off of good will alone. However, if our opponents are negative, we will not be able to defend ourselves. This, of course, works both ways. If we run a campaign dragged to the gutter with uh, both sides running negative attacks, very little progress will be made in that cycle. If we run too many negative attacks, then our reputation will be severely hindered and we begin to lose support. Appeal of our uh, campaign determines if we will attempt to win over independence or attempt to undermine the base of our opponents by converting them into independence. We may also go um, for a uh, broad message. We'll achieve the goals of both options with a noticeably smaller rate. Although we may run our campaign without consideration, considering our opponents, if we uh, are to get the like up, we can work to route their campaign and receive advanced information from their plans to adjust our plans for their cycle accordingly. If we rely on this strategy, we must remain aware that potentially that our ties to the campaign may be exposed and discredit our side. So if we try to spy on them, we won't be happy. 100% chance to fail. I mean, that sounds bad. Oh no, it's 100% chance that we succeed. If we get too cocky with our practices, okay, so I'm guessing it's first one's probably 0, 100, next one's probably 20, 80, 40, 60, 50, 50, so on and so forth. So I think first on, we want to leak negative information on the op campaign. That just seems, uh, okay, now it's 11 to, eight. okay, so, so yeah, it's gonna swing more and more, but the first one's free. So what do we want to do? Let us appeal to independence. We have, we're appealing reputation. I, we're going to go first on with a positive message. I don't believe the Nazis know what it means to run a positive message, so we should be fine. Goner, positive press. That sounds good. Okay, we'll, we'll, leave that, uh, we'll leave that as it may. Anything here that I care about too much? I think the answer is going to be a nopers on that one, big fellas. Oh yeah, we also want to talk to, uh, we want to ease Southern fears again. I'm, I'm happy to have so much political power, like, I'm not used to it. By the way, the fact that we have, like, 45% and we still lost votes to the Democrats, a little, uh, little shameful, isn't it? It's a little, it's a little embarrassing. Now again, I don't know how often we're going to be passing more laws. Like, most of the laws seem like they were in this section. This is more about, like, social, uh, standings, but... Like, nothing here says the word act at the end. You know, yeah, uh, tend to pass the National Health Care Act. Anything here that's like, we'll try to pass education. Uh, integration, integration, not in crisis. I don't see anything of that sort. You're still looking good. I'm, we should be able to get out of the, should be able to get this out of pretty, pretty quickly. Okay, volunteers, let's just send you to... Canadian border seems fine. Let's bring you two into, uh... Do you have another general? There we go. The Greenland Provincial Council election of 1971. Across Greenland, thousands held their breath as the votes for the Greenland Provincial Council was tallied. The members of the Schmutz, including Mochfeldt, Olsen, and Emil Johansson, were all gathered together, each nervously awaiting the results, as all three men had uh, run for seats in the council. Then finally, the results were announced. All three men have been elected to the Provincial Council. The gathered uh, Shumut supporters erupted into racious cheers and applause. The three men could scarcely believe their victory, one that was greater than they had anticipated. Yet this reinforced uh, that their uh, cause was just and that the people of Greenland were behind them. Excitement was spreading, and for the first time, many were imagining a, tr a truly free Greenland. Elsewhere in Greenland, a small and modest home in uh, Illenshut, Lars Chemnitz uh, sat in his warm house. Uh, warm home, a mug of coffee in his hand, and a daily copy of the At the Atu Gag du Lietet, uh, in the other. He was unable to hide his satisfaction. 
Uh, he has he read the election results uh, in the Greenland's oldest newspaper, along with other outsiders. He too had been elected to the provincial council. Between him and the success of the Anushmut party, one thing was certain. The status quo of the Americans had a joy for so long was ending. Greenland was making her own future, and Chemnitz was uh, more confident than ever it was going to be a bright one. But I'll say it at least right now, it's a really good time for us to end this episode. So if you enjoyed me, thumbs up. Then now, enjoy your thumbs down. If you want to see more, subscribe and goodbye.